This is Brain Ponderings with Mark Matson. Conversations with scientists at the forefront of brain research. It's my pleasure in this episode to talk with Jim Kinnearum. He's a professor of neuroscience and uh, also at the Mind Brain Institute at Johns Hopkins University. Jim's an expert in understanding what goes on in the brain that enable, able, enables us to navigate through environments in the real world or even virtually. And um, this all involves visual information coming in. Jim started his uh, research career as PhD focusing on the visual system and the visual cortex. And Jim, you want to start there and then and then you can talk about what happens downstream of that. Sure. The work that I did as a grad student uh, is actually fairly far removed from what I'm doing now, but we, I started out uh, uh, studying uh, the, uh, the primary visual cortex uh, in non-human primates. This is the first part of the processing stream of the brain when the information goes from the retina, your eyeballs, <laughs> back into the brain, the visual cortex sits right back here in the back of the head. <laughs> so that's the first uh, processing stream in the, the outer part of the brain called the, the neocortex, which is where you know, the, the, the major part of, of our brain. So it's very low level processing where uh, the, uh, the two images of the world that go onto your eyeballs, <laughs> uh, Get represented and sort of broken up into a bunch of little pixels, um, little uh, called you know, photoreceptors respond to light at different parts of the brain and then uh, at different parts of the visual field. And then the information gets routed through a couple of synapse, you know, connection relays into the back of the brain where things start getting put back together again. So I was just studying how that process starts and how uh, responses of visual neurons in this part of the brain that respond to oriented bars of light, which has been known for years and years ago, discovering things like that is what you know, won a Nobel Prize for uh, Hubel and Diesel uh, uh, many decades ago. We started understanding though that these responses to oriented bars could be modulated by the orientation of surrounding bars. So showing a contextual modulation of, of information uh, that uh, uh, to uh, uh, an oriented bar. Uh, so these bars outside surrounding the oriented bar would not normally cause the brain cell we were recording to fire. So the, the, the oriented bar had to be in a specific location in, in the, what's called the visual fields, the, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in when you, when you know, part of the space that, that is impinging on this part of the, retina in the back of the brain. So, uh, so they, they would only respond to an oriented bar in a small region of space. But we found that though know, these bars outside this region of space could actually affect how this cell was firing to the bar inside its what's so-called its receptive field. So, so it's just showing like, more, more, more complex processing how the, how the brain starts trying to put everything together in context and, and, and construct a model of the world. So you were putting uh, electrodes in the visual cortex of animals. That's right. And were you recording from individual neurons or, or groups of neurons? Well, we were recording uh, uh, the activity of, of single neurons. But uh, these were so-called extracellular recordings. So the electrode was outside the cell, but it was still able to monitor the, the electrical activity of a single cell. So we could find out what, what, what that cell uh, cared about in terms of what- You could see when it fires an action potential. Precisely, right. Okay. Okay, so then let's go from the visual, that information from the retina and visual cortex. Where is it processed, that, and, and which is what you've focused on now, what, brain region seems critical for navigation and spatial relationships. Sure. So, um, so there are many different brain areas that 
are devoted to processing vision. Uh, and uh, many of them, which sort of in the, in the dorsal part of the brain appear to process uh, spatial types of information about where things are, how things are moving through space. This is highly simplified, but to a first approximation. Uh, and then, but another visual pathway goes into the, what's called the ventral part of the brain, so-called temporal lobe, kind of right behind your ear, uh, which seems to be involved more in processing of form or shape or identifying objects. And, and both of these inputs then funnel into the, what's called the medial temporal lobe, where, uh, which is where now I'm studying now, especially a part of the brain called the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex, uh, which are known to be involved not only in uh, uh, processing of, of space and involved in navigation and spatial memory, but also, especially in humans, uh, are critical for what's called episodic memory, the ability to remember events that happened in your in your life in, in the past. So there are these two major themes of research in the hippocampus, spatial memory navigation and episodic memory. And a large part of my research is to try to understand how these two seemingly disparate topics really uh, uh, come together and So, and, and so the, there's kind other. of a sequencing, like if you go and walk on a trail and if you do it a several, just a few times, you can close your eyes like right now and kind of visualize where you're going and somehow not only do you have to your brain encode what in the spatial relationships but when and when you saw it or took a turn here or there. that's right that's right so uh, a large part of what we now know about how the system works is uh is that the hippocampus and regions like it uh, have a very strong ability to create sequences of events or sequences of movement. Yeah. Uh, so that's what you're describing. You, you do you know, all the time. The example I like to give is like you get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and it's dark out. The light You don't yeah. want to turn your light on to disturb your spouse. So you, but you can still find your way into the into the bathroom without bumping into the furniture and all because you 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 have in your head this mental map of yeah. your environment and the objects that are in it and you can keep track of your movement through that environment uh, just by keeping track of your own movements through space and updating in your head where you think you are in the environment. That's something we call path integration is the technical term. Uh, and and uh, so in addition to the sensory information, like the visual information we were talking about earlier, this other process, path integration, keeping track of your movement through space, just by knowing how fast you're moving and what direction you're moving, you can update where you are in your mental map. <laughs> Uh, even in the absence of visual input or other sensory input. So that's a critically also important part of, of our spatial navigation system that works together with vision. And then you can do as you were just suggesting, you can now even just mentally do that. So I can close my eyes now and I can mentally trace my steps from the parking garage across campus, up the stairways into my office uh, by a similar process of, of recreating the sequence of of events as I mentally move through space, I can remember the things I saw as I walked by them. That's so way uh, mental imagery and, and mental navigation. Now to 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 record electrical activity in individual neurons or you know clusters of neurons requires a kind of invasive procedure, putting electrodes in the brain, and so it's not can't be done in humans. Uh, from the standpoint of doing experiments. So most of your work's been in, in rats, and, right. but, but you're talking about closing your eyes. You, unfortunately, you can't ask a rat to close its eyes and then tell you what, but you've developed methods where you can um, nevertheless get towards an understanding of the circuits involved in that kind of thing. Right. And can you talk about, you mentioned Hubel and Weasel getting the Nobel Prize for their work on the primary visual cortex. 
Could you talk about uh, a more recent Nobel Prize awarded for identifying some cells and mechanisms that are involved in navigation? Sure. So uh, that was uh, um, the Nobel Prize was awarded in 2014, I believe, <laughs> to uh, John O'Keefe uh, uh, in London and uh, Edward and Mybert Moser uh, in Trondheim, Norway. Uh, for discoveries of uh, cells called place cells, which is what O'Keefe discovered in the 1970s, uh, and cells called grid cells that the uh, Moser uh, lab uh, discovered in 2004, 2005, uh, around then. Um, what, what, the place cell is a cell that if you're recording from a rat, and it actually turns out there's now good evidence in humans, you find similar cells based on certain techniques. Hmm. Uh, but if an animal is moving around in an environment, if you can just imagine, you know, this is a rat moving around so a rectangular environment. What O'Keefe discovered was that if he's recording activity of cells in this part of the brain called hippocampus, that the cell is mostly silent, except when a rat occupies a specific location. So maybe in this corner here. So if I'm recording my electrode and I'm listening to what you said, action potentials, the, uh, the spiking activity, that's the, how neurons communicate to each other electrically. Uh, and I put this to an audio speaker so I can actually hear this, this spike. It's, it sounds like a pop, pop. And as the rat's moving around, the cell is silent, but the rat goes here, pop, 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 pop and that's quiet. <laughs> And then nothing's happening. The rats, the cell's quiet when a rat runs around here and he goes back here, pop, 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 and it's firing. So this cell only fires when the rat's in this specific location of this rectangular environment. But then another cell will fire when the rat's over here. And another cell will fire in the middle and so forth. And what you find, if you record enough of these cells, you find that the whole environment is tiled by a bunch of cells that each have a specific location that they like to fire at. And this is called the, the place field of the cell. And what O'Keefe uh, uh, recognized uh, is that this firing of the cells may indicate that the hippocampus creates what's called a cognitive map or a mental map of the rat's environment. This is an idea of a cognitive map that goes back decades earlier than, than that. And Edward Tolman was a psychologist at, at Berkeley who first proposed that we all have these maps in our head <laughs> that we use not only to navigate around the world, but just to organize our experience in ways that uh, we can be very flexible in our behavior. And, and, and we're not just tied to habitual types of behavior, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, that we can change our behavior based on changing circumstances. And he hypothesized that a map-like representation is a very useful way to do that. And O'Keefe uh, realized that maybe the hippocampus is where this uh, occurred. And he and Lynn Adell wrote a really landmark book, you know, no, no, pen, no pun intended, but uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, called The Hippocampus as a Cognitive Map, where they laid out the idea that indeed that that's what the hippocampus does and what these place cells are. They're the building blocks of our mental maps of our environment. We learn how to get from one place to the other. How do we know where the grocery store is? Where's our home? How do we know? Uh, how to get from one place to another, how do we know if we're driving from one place to another and suddenly there's a detour that we now we can take a, 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 an alternate route to get there uh, and, and so forth. So that, and so this is discovered in rats, but there's very good evidence in that, that humans have a, a, a similar structure and the hippocampus plays similar roles. Um, so then fast forward uh, 20 years or so, 20, 25, uh, uh, in the mid, 2004, 2005, um, uh, the Edward and Mybert Moser's lab uh, were trying to understand how does how do these place cells get their firing properties? Why does this cell know to fire over here, and this cell know to fire over here, and this cell knows to fire over here? So they started putting electrodes in the part of the brain that feeds into the hippocampus, the area where O'Keefe found these place cells. They want to know what's upstream of that, what's the properties of cells that feed input into these place cells. And they discovered this remarkable cell type called the grid cell. Okay. It's similar to a place cell in that it has very similar spatial firing properties, 
But unlike a play cell, which fires typically only in one location and environment, at least in a, in, a, in a small environment, it fires in one location. Grid cells fire in many locations. So a cell might fire when the rat's here, pop, 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 you know, pop, pop, So it fires in many locations. But the amazing thing about it was that these locations weren't random. They were arranged as in this triangular or hexagonal <laughs> pattern. Huh. Uh, think, think of a, a, of a honeycomb in a, in, a, in a bee's nest. You've got you know, a six-sided structure uh, with, a, with also a point in the middle. You know, that is how these cells fire. The, the, the firing locations of these grid cells were not random, but they seem to form this almost like a graph paper-like <laughs> coordinate frame of, 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 of space, hmm. not a not a, like a Cartesian coordinate frame X and Y, like you, you know, like when you do in algebra and you plot X versus Y. You know, this is a, a coordinate frame that's based on on, on points that are uh, equidistant to each other, but actually a sixty degree angle. So it's like little triangles that, that tessellate the space. So the thought was that 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 this is a the, the, the coordinate frame, the, the, the spatial framework <laughs> that sends input into the play cells and the, and, the, and the hippocampus takes these cells at the spatial coordinate frame and extracts from that and creates this map where each cell is selected to one specific location. So the combination of these two discoveries of the, the play cells by, by O'Keefe, uh, which then was, was the, the first study and inspired this idea of the hippocampus being this cognitive map and inspiring people like the Moser lab and frankly my lab too, to, to, to look into uh, the inputs to the hippocampus, try to understand how, that, how these play cells are formed that then led to the discovery of these remarkable grid cells. And then uh, the three of them all share the Nobel prize for this discovery. Okay, and then your work, you, you took advantage of their findings and, and, uh, um, and asked some additional questions, uh, uh, which are important in us navigating, generating spatial maps. Um, if I'm driving home and there's a storm and a tree falls across the road and the road's blocked off, uh, then I have to rethink where I'm going and take a different path. Uh, so aren't, isn't that like, in a general sense, one of the questions you're trying to understand? Right, so, so one of the major goals of our lab is, is to try to understand this part of the inputs. It's, part, it's called the enterrhinal cortex and specifically what's called the medial enterrhinal cortex. All that means is that the enterrhinal cortex is split into two, a, a, a part medial more towards the middle of the head <laughs> And one called lateral, more towards you know away from the middle of the head, uh, and that's called the lateral enterrhinal cortex. So we've been under, trying to understand uh, these two different parts of the enterrhinal cortex that have very different cell properties and diff different anatomical connections and all. So they clearly are doing different things, providing different information into the hippocampus, into these play cells. So we've been trying to understand the differences between these two regions, and so. So one experiment we've been trying to do to study the medial enterrhinal cortex is what is its role in this path integration process that I mentioned earlier. Um, a lot of work um, since the discovery of the grid cells has really led to the idea with lots of strong evidence that this medial enterrhinal area is heavily involved in this path integration process. A lot of this work came from the Moser's lab subsequent uh, uh, studies of, of these properties, but, but many labs started studying these cells once they were discovered. It was just, <laughs> everybody saw these cells when, they, when that paper came out and then everyone said, this is one of the most amazing brain discoveries ever. <laughs> Even before I got the Nobel Prize, everybody knew this was a Nobel Prize worthy <laughs> discovery. <laughs> um, and, and people started a, a ton of research went into that to understand these cells. And it's, it's, it's fairly well accepted. You know, nothing is 100% certain in this field, but, <laughs> but there's very good evidence that this medial pathway is heavily involved in path integration. So one thing we've wanted to understand is uh, how exactly that works and how does 
path integration work in, in the hippocampal system. And, and this goes back to my graduate work. I'm not sorry, my, my postdoctoral work. Well, I was a postdoctoral fellow with, with Bruce McNaughton uh, at the University of Arizona. And uh, at the time I was there, uh, McNaughton was heavily uh, um, um, uh, proposing the idea that the hippocampus was, was, was very strongly involved in this path integration process, that it wasn't just passively responding to sensory inputs from the world out there, but it was an active process of keeping track of one's movements through space in order to uh, uh, update where you are in the world. And that's what drives play cells. So that was you know, part of my research and just for a long time. Uh, and we started- And, and, that's, yeah. and this, this is a, uh, seems to me uh, like the a strong analogy to the GPS on our cell phone, but, but, but that's a computer and yeah. you're studying the brain. Right. So uh, it's, it's analogous to that in, in, in terms of its function. So the GPS on your computer and, you know, I, I like to talk about, I got my, this is my, my, my pocket hippocampus here, right? This is my, <laughs> <laughs> my cell phone. Uh, I, I, I have maps in it so I can navigate around using a GPS and so forth. Uh, it also stores a lot of my memories, getting back to this idea that the hippocampus is not only for navigation, but just for storing memory. Um, uh, but, it's, but, but how the GPS works is, 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 is different from how we think the hippocampus works for path integration. So the, the, the stronger analogy, as far as path integration is concerned, uh, it, it goes to the days prior to GPS, uh, hundreds of years ago when, when, when navigators would sail across the oceans and they didn't have any GPS, right? So how did they keep track of where they were as they sailed across these vast expanses of, of water with no landmarks in sight? So they actually did something almost identical conceptually to what we think the animals are doing. So they would have a pilot whose job on the, on the, uh, the, as the navigator was to try to keep track of where they were on the ocean. And they had these charts and they knew, okay, if I'm, if some, say I'm gonna sail across you know, from Europe to the new world, okay? And I'm leaving a port in, 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 in Europe and I know that this is where my starting point is. And every half hour or so, they would take a measurement. They use the compass to say, we're sailing this direction. And they would take a measurement of speed. How fast is the ship moving? And they would say, okay, if we've been moving at X speed, how many knots <laughs> uh, in the half hour in this direction, they can say, well, I know I was, we started here. I've been moving this direction, this speed for half hour. They calculate, I must be here now. And they mark that on their chart. And then half hour later, they'll take the same measurement. Okay, now we've been moving in this direction at this speed, we must be here. And they map onto their chart, their estimate of where they are. And this is what we call, called dead reckoning is often the terminology used when you're talking about nav you know, human, human navigation like that. But that's how they, would, how they would keep track of where they are and realize, okay, we're probably halfway across the ocean now. Uh, and they, but this is prone to lots of error because they, they, their speed estimates might be wrong. Their, 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 uh, their compass may be a little wrong, wrong. So the error will accumulate over time. But then as they're going along, maybe they'll see a, a, an island a distance. And according to their chart, well, we wouldn't expect it to see that island for another hour or so. But now they're seeing it now. So they realize they've underestimated with their location and then they'll update their location. Okay, we thought we were here, we're really here. And then, so the, the, that landmark of the island is used to correct the error that is accumulated based on this dead reckoning. So the dead reckoning was, was there when they had no landmarks, and then they used the landmarks to correct the error. And then eventually, you know, they got to their destination with some reasonable accuracy. So, so that, it was actually Charles Darwin is usually credited with the, person who first at least published the idea that maybe that's how the animals navigate as well. Maybe the animals navigation system uses <laughs> the same uh, principles that, that the uh, that, that, that navigators and pilots on, on ocean vessels used. Um, and so, so this, is one, this is a kind of a backdrop to how we think uh, uh, animal brains 
uh, you use this path integration process. They have estimates of their speed, and we know there are cells that encode speed. They have estimates of direction. We know there are cells that encode the rat's direction, and we know that there are cells that encode location. So we think that all the components are there in this biological computer we have <laughs> to actually calculate position, update on your own mental map of where you are by updating positions, just like these navigators do by, by integrating uh, speed and direction over time. And then that gets you a, a, a position signal. What, what kind of, uh, how do you simulate that, uh, you know, in the, in the laboratory for the rats? What kind of uh, environment do you create so that you can study that? Yeah. So one thing we've done recently is a collaboration with a, a, a mechanical engineering group uh, uh, led by Noah Cowan uh, here at Hopkins. And uh, uh, their lab, uh, they're engineers, but they're biologists too. They really want to use principles of biology to help them understand how, how, how do animals solve problems that that roboticists are trying to solve, taking inspiration from the animal literature to make better controllers for robots, for example, and also to use the principles of engineering to also understand the brain. So it's a real back and forth, you know, you know, feedback loop there. So I've been collaborating with Noah for a number of years now, and one apparatus that we built, what we, we called the dome, it's a uh, a planetarium style uh, half dome apparatus, about seven feet in diameter and we have animals we train the animals to 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 run around in in, in a circle inside this dome and, and we can project images onto the inside of the dome uh, and, and and we just use geometric shapes that will uh, that will project onto the wall and and, and the rat uses these as landmarks and we can tell that uh if 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 we record a place cell in uh as the rat runs around in this circular apparatus, and we say this, okay, the rat's running around here, we find one cell that fires at, at, at three o'clock, another cell fires at, 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 at 12 o'clock, you know, using just the, the clock terminology. And if we take these landmarks and we rotate them, well, then the, the, the firing fields of the cells rotate the same amount. So the whole map rotates with the landmarks. This is telling us that the landmarks are, are controlling the map very similar to how the island can control a map in the navigators when I said that. Yeah. The, the animal sees the islands over there and says, okay, I, here, here's where I need, where I am. Well, the animals use these landmarks that we're providing the same way to, to keep control over the, this map-like representation. So now we wanna say, well, we, we, we wanna, um, and, and decades of work on the hippocampus on these place cells have used these exact kind of manipulations. And we know how strongly these landmarks can control the, the spatial map. But we know much less about the mechanisms of this path integration process. We know it happens, but the mechanisms of how it happens is much less clear. So, uh, so Noah and I, and, and we've got you know, wonderful uh, postdoc students, uh, 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 Manu Madhav and, and Ravi Jai Kumar, we developed this dome apparatus and what, what they designed a system that we could keep track of the rat's movement as it ran around this circular track. And we could rotate these landmarks that we projected as a function of the rat's movement. So in other words, we could, if the rat was running this way, we could take the landmarks and rotate them in the opposite direction by the same speed that the rat's running, but in the opposite direction. And when the rat stopped running, the landmarks stopped moving. When the rat ran slowly this way, the landmarks went slowly the other way. When the rat went, ran quickly this way, the landmarks ran, went quickly the other way. So it was a, they, they mirrored precisely the movement of the animal just in the opposite direction. So what does that mean? That means when, when the rat starts here, normally when the landmarks are not moving the rat will run around and this place so it fires here will fire again at this location the rat runs and fires here fires here okay now when we move the landmarks the rat runs this way but the landmarks are now moving the opposite direction and they meet up with the rat now 180 <laughs> degrees away and because we know that these landmarks can control the firing of the map what happens is the place that was firing here now fires here huh 
So, and then the rat runs on landmarks and now it's firing here. So under these conditions, the play cell is now firing in two locations in space. This is space defined by our camera or by, you know, by our, the real world framework. But relative to the inside of the dome, based on where the landmarks are in this so-called landmark frame of reference, the cell is firing normally. It's firing here and here because it's seeing the exact same landmarks here and here because of the way we're moving them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we're giving the rat the illusion, basically, that it's, that's running twice as fast as normal. Okay, so that's the setup because we, we had to do this because the real question was, we've now put this rat in this virtual world where suddenly it's like the flash. It runs twice as fast as normal. What happens now when we turn the landmarks off? Now we're in this path integration mode. There are no landmarks to control the firing of cells anymore. Does the system revert back to firing just once per lap, which it would have done before we did our manipulation? Or have we retrained this path integrator to now recognize the fact that, okay, I'm in a world now where I move twice as fast as normal. So now I need to, now I'm going to, update my map based on my perceived speed. <laughs> and now I'm gonna to continue to fire twice per lap. And it turns out the latter happened. So we, we showed that this, what we call a game factor, the relationship between how fast the rat's moving through the real world and how fast the rat's mental representation of where it is moves in its head. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that that, that in, in order for this path integration to work, that relationship has to be one, right? So if I move a certain distance and direction in the real world, in my mental map, I have to update by that same amount. Yeah. So uh, otherwise, it's not a good map, right? If if if, if I move a certain speed I, I, or a direct distance, I move you know ten feet in the real world, but in my head, I, I only update that I've moved five feet. <laughs> And then I turn and move three feet. And in my map, I turn only move up to, I move like two and a half feet. Well, very soon where I think I am is gonna have no relationship to where I really am in the world. So there has to be this one-to-one -one mapping between yeah. my real movements and my updating the head. Yeah. And what we show in this experiment is that that is not a, a, a hardwired relationship, that this is something that we call it's plastic. It can be changed through experience. And we were actually surprised at how easy it was <laughs> to change this, that just 30 minutes of experience in our virtual world where the rat thinks it's moving twice as fast has updated how its map calculates position based on the rat's perception of speed rather than its actual speed. Uh, and then we did other experiments where we had the, the landmarks move in the same direction of the animal, but at different speed. So in this case, if the rat's moving this way, the landmarks are actually moving with the animal by a certain amount, a little less. So in this case, see the rat might run one lap and it gets back to where it started, but since the landmarks have moved ahead, it doesn't think it's back to where it started until it goes a little further. And we can have this set up that the landmarks move with the animal so slowly that it may take the rat two or three or four laps through the real world in order to actually do one lap relative to these moving landmarks. At the limit, it's like you being on a treadmill, right? Where, where you're, you're, you're moving, 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 moving on a treadmill, but you're not getting anywhere. <laughs> where, with this manipulation, we're approaching like a treadmill situation where the rat's running around, but the, the landmarks just keep following the rat. So it doesn't seem to be getting anywhere, even though you know, it, it knows it's moving around. So, and we get similar results of recalibration of this gain factor under those conditions. It would be, uh, I wonder whether with, with that, um, in that, the scenario you just talked about, whether there are structural changes, increased number of synapses. We know from, there's a lot of evidence that if you raise, put rats or mice in an enriched environment, kind of a playground-like environment in large cages where they can move around a lot of different objects, um, there are, there's increased number of synapses in certain regions of the hippocampus. In the whole hippocampus can even get bigger 
And of course, I guess I saw recently you doing some collaboration to looking at aging right. and Alzheimer's disease where the hippocampus is severely affected and, and people with Alzheimer's in the early stages, they have trouble you know, re remembering where did I just go and, and spatial orientations. Uh, but could you talk about, are, are there, there been any correlations between the electrophysiology and structural changes? Yeah. Um, that, nothing in the lab, in our lab, have, 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 we, we've not been looking at, at that question. Okay. Um, uh, as you mentioned, there's a lot of work on that, especially you know, going back decades where rats that are raised in enriched environments, they've got bigger brains, much more synaptic changes. The, the connectivity between neurons is, is, is greater. Um, there's less of that kind of work in the hippocampus related to these play cells and so I forth. Uh, I wouldn't say none, but it's, 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 it's not as prominent in the area of investigation. Now, there's lots of work on um, how the strength of synapses can change. Uh, uh, you know, how, how the connection between one neuron to the next can get greater or weaker based on experience. Yeah. Uh, lots of work by many labs over many years uh, uh, have, have, have worked on that. Uh, the phenomenon is called long-term potentiation. And also another discovery in the 1970s that was first discovered in the hippocampus, which was part of the, a, a series of, of findings that occurred around that time that really put the hippocampus into so one of the forefront brain structures that people study, that, that, that uh, the, the discovery that connections between neurons can become stronger yeah. and then later discovered also weaker based on experience. And, and that's a model for the cellular basis of memory, how, how a memory is formed. They're, they're, they're formed by changing how changing the wiring of the, of the, of the, of the brain to yeah. make different neurons uh, respond differently to their inputs. Uh, and then how that, how, how that is also related to structural changes. Do you get more neurons or fewer neurons, more connections or less connections? You know, that, that's a, that's a whole other, other story. So, so, so it's very likely that there are structural changes that are correlated with, uh, you know, one an animal, say in your dome yeah. you know learns that and yeah um, when you switch yeah i, I think so and, and i mean just quickly and so what's really interesting that the the i think one of the strong evidence for that comes from the human literature and this this gets back to the idea of uh, a lot of everything that i'm talking about that we understand in rats we think have very strong correlates with what happens in humans not not one to one you know we're not rats <laughs> they're not humans but but there's a lot of commonalities. And one interesting commonality is the famous study of, of, of taxi drivers in London. So uh, in London, you have to pass a really hard test <laughs> to, become, to get a license to drive a cab. Uh, and it, and it's called, the test is called the knowledge. You have to really, and then they study months and months to, un, to, to study maps of London and, and routes. What's the best way to get from this part of London to the next? And what happens if you're trying to go this way and there's a detour, what do you do next? And they have to pass this test. Do they, uh, do they still do that since with the advent of GPS? I, as far as I understand, yes, but I can't guarantee that that's true. <laughs> but certainly 20 years ago, it was true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and which is when these studies were done. I would, okay. and, and it turns out they, they took cab drivers and they, they, they uh, put them in a, 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 a brain scanner. And what they discovered was the, the hippocampus of these taxi drivers was larger <laughs> than the hippocampus of a control subject who was not a, a cab driver. Uh, and specifically the right hippocampus. So in humans, the right hippocampus is very different from the hippocampus on the left side of the brain. Uh, but this is an indication that something structural happened. The volume of the hippocampus was, was larger in cab drivers who had to spend yeah. all this time studying and really have this very, very detailed 
map-like representation of, of London that they know how to get from A to B without actually having to use a, a, a GPS. It, it would be interesting to, if, if they are using GPS now, it'd be interesting to, to see whether, you know, now cab drivers today, they're uh, on average their hippocampus, right hippocampus is smaller than 20 years ago. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure that if any cab driver now relying on their GPS and basically just following the directions that the, uh, their, their, their iPhone tells them to go, would not have the same kind of change in their hippocampus. Or if it does, it would be a much longer process if maybe just by, maybe after 20, 30 years of experience, of following these routes, if they built up this map, maybe then, but it wouldn't happen so quickly. And I mean, I, I moved to Baltimore from Houston about 12 years ago. Um, right when you know GPSs were getting much more popular and, and ubiquitous, I don't know Baltimore nearly as well as I know Houston in terms of my own knowledge, right? Because every time I, I, I drive in Baltimore now, from the moment I moved here, I would just put my, you know, my, my destination, my iPhone or my Waze app, whatever, and it would just tell me where to go. So I didn't have to really be paying attention. Whereas prior to that in Houston, GPSs were not so ubiquitous. I had to learn how to get from point A to point B and then I could do it on my own. So it's, it's, it, 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 I'm, I'm sure that if, if you could somehow trace my map of hippocampus, <laughs> map of Houston versus Baltimore, <laughs> the part of my hippocampus that encodes Houston is much bigger than that than it could Baltimore. <laughs> Um, you, so you uh, were involved in a, in a, uh, space station experiment. Oh, yes. Right. Can yes, you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, this was when I was a postdoctoral fellow with, with Bruce McDonton and, and, and Carol Barnes. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Bruce, um, was, uh, uh, an early and strong advocate of the position that the hippocampus was heavily involved in this path integration process. At the time, it was, it's a very well accepted idea now. At the time, people didn't necessarily buy it. They said, okay, yeah, you make a good case, but you know, we're not sure that's true or not. So uh, at, at the same time, uh, uh, this was when President George H.W. Bush uh, declared the 1990s as the decade of the brain. And there was a big push for brain research and yeah. lots of funding and NIH and so forth. And, and as part of this effort, uh, NASA decided to devote a space shuttle mission to brain research. And uh, uh, Bruce and, uh, and put in this application, a, a grant proposal that we would, would record these place cells up in zero gravity in a space shuttle. And lo and behold, we got that grant funded. So now we were about, we were gonna do some <laughs> space shuttle experiments. And the, the idea was to put a strong test to this idea that these play cells were controlled by these path integration cues. And the idea Bruce came up with was, I'm gonna describe this. So you can imagine the, 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 the corner defined by the three surfaces of this box here. Yeah. We, we designed a track where the rat would run like an, on an L shape on this surface. So okay. we do what's called a yaw, a, a, a movement of the head like this. And then the rat would go onto a new surface here and turn around, do another 90 degree yaw movement, move on to this third surface, make a third 90 degree turn, and then we we'll come back here. And now it's where it started, okay? But is this in zero gravity? This is, this is in zero gravity. We, how, we, do they, how do they stay on it? So we, we, we had a narrow track about that wide. Uh -huh. And we actually put some Velcro strips and we thought the rats would just grab onto the strips, but it oh, turns out the rats told us, uh, we did some pro testing on the, 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 the KC-135. That's what's, that's NASA's airplane that does this parabolic flight. Okay. They call it the vomit comet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, if you saw the movie Apollo 13 and other movies yeah. that, that have 
scenes of weightlessness. They're all filmed in, 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 in this kind of aircraft. So as, as the aircraft is, is going over and, and, and going down, it's in free fall. And then you're in a period of about 30, 40 seconds of, of, of microgravity. And that's where you see the people float around. So we put the rats in that too. And what the rats did, they just grabbed the outside of, this, of the track, like a ladder. And they're with their 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 four limbs and they just kind of scooched themselves along uh, as they ran around this track. I see. But so so the experiment was uh, and, and so we, we didn't know what they would do until we 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 tested this. But that, but that was one of the points of this test was to show that we could get the rats to to move around in, in zero gravity. They they adapted it to it really well actually. <laughs> um, but the, the but we wanted to as the rat ran around this track here. Uh, the idea was that after it, it has gone back to its starting point, but it only made three 90 degree turns, one 90 degree turn on each surface. And normally in the real world, right, you have to make four 90 degree turns to get back to your starting point. If you're walking long, you'll, you know, 190, another 90, yeah. another 90, 190, now you've got 180 degrees, 360 degrees, you're back where you started. But by moving along three orthogonal surfaces, you can get back to where you started having only gone 270 degrees of, of, of movement in this so-called yaw axis. All the visual information is telling you back, you're back where you started, but your internal reckoning sense, your path integration has said, well, no, you're not where you started. You've only gone 270 degrees of turn. You need to go another, 90 degrees <laughs> before you back where you start. So now we, we've engineered a very specific conflict between what the path integration system says where you are and where the visual landmarks say where you are. And the prediction was that on this special three-dimensional track we gave the animal, that the hippocampal map would actually shift forward the fire on one surface, but then as the rat runs around the surface, it wouldn't fire here again. Even though the visual cues told it fire here, it wouldn't fire again until the rat was on this surface, completing 360. And then as it ran around, it wouldn't fire until this surface. So, so the whole map would move around, you know, sort of lagging the rat's actual movement because of the fact that the system was expecting the rat to go 360 degrees before it reached its starting point together. So that was the idea. Uh, so we trained rats and we trained, we not only had to train the rats to do the test, we had to train the astronauts to do the experiments. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I spent many time, many, many weekends in Johnson Space Center. And he, I just moved to Houston for my first faculty position there. So I spent a number of my weekends and the, the astronaut crew totally dedicated, gave up their weekends to, to me to work there. And they were so jazzed about this experiment. <laughs> uh, and yeah. You know, so so they had to learn how to use an amplifier, how to so you had the animals implanted with the electrodes right. with, with essentially wires, and they had to plug them into an amplifier and know how to right. They had to it. know how to coax the rat to move around. They had to uh, uh, uh we, we couldn't guarantee that the electrodes would still be recording good cells. You know, we had we 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 had really good hippocampal cells when we loaded them into the cargo bay of the space shuttle. But four days later was when our experiment was scheduled. And, you know, all the forces of liftoff, you know, we didn't know what, <laughs> what yeah. So we had to train the astronauts to actually move the electrodes to try to find the proper cells oh. again. Uh, so it was a lot of effort, but. Uh, and then were you, were, were you communicating with them as they were doing it, somebody? From we the were not, not directly, but we no. worked in communication through their NASA comms. So, so uh, you know, there was if a specific, had, what's that? If they had any problems, they'd let you know. Right, they would go down and then the message would be relayed to us and then we would give yeah. you know, advice back and all. So it was, a, so as is often the case, we didn't find evidence for exactly what we were anticipating, but we, we did find though that there were, the cells did have spatial firing up in zero gravity. But we didn't see this movement as we predicted, but we saw really other interesting things about how some cells would fire um, at each of the three corners when the rat made this turn. You wouldn't see that 
normally on, on in, in, in one sheet here. The cell would a play cell will fire it in one of these corners, not the yeah. others. Yeah. But in zero gravity, it was firing at all three corners. Yeah. The other cells would fire at each of the locations where the rat transitions from one surface to the next. It would fire here, here, and here. Again, you wouldn't see that in normal. So, so there was still something going on, uh, which we interpret as this conflict between the rat's internal sense and the external cues, and the system got confused and, yeah. and it could no longer distinguish one corner from the next from the next. And uh, so, it, it was you know th those are the results we had. That was a very interesting. Study. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a couple, a couple other things. So all your works and, and, and people working in this area is focused on visual input. You know, but when we move through our environment, there's other things, we hear things, we may smell something, yeah. you know, and, and again, closing your eyes, you may remember that you, uh, whatever, smelled some nice flowers when you're walking over here. And that information comes into the same system, the anaural cortex and hippocampus. Um, has there been any attempt to, to look at how other sensory inputs are, somehow they have to be integrated into this cognitive map and, and the, the re recalling of what hap what happened to you right. at a particular location. Right. So that so that brings us to one of the other major lines of research in our lab, trying to understand what this other half of the entronic cortex, called the lateral entronic cortex, is doing for the hippocampus. Okay. So the medial entronic cortex is where, as I discovered before, you've got these great cells and these cells encode speed and direction of movement and many other factors that all seem to be involved in this this path integration calculation. And the question is, well, what's this lateral adrenal pathway doing? <laughs> okay. um, now, at the same time that the Moser lab, you know, my Britain Everett Moser lab uh, published the, the discovery of the grid cells, our lab published a paper where we were recording medial entorhinal and lateral entorhinal cortex cells at the same time and finding that they were very different. It turns out we had some of these grid cells in our data set, but we just didn't know what they were. We had these cells that fired in multiple spots. We didn't recognize that they, were, they had this beautiful triangular lattice pattern. We just saw cells that fired in different spots and knew the Mosul lab had published similar results a year before. But then when they published their grid cells, they were like, oh, that's what these cells are. Cool. <laughs> but our finding was that those cells were not in this lateral entorhinal pathway. So, uh, and, and at the same time, nor could we find anything that looked like a good spatial signal there, or okay. it, it, at best, it was a weak map-like representation. And at, at best, if you squinted and kind of really were very optimistic, <laughs> you might say that there's some spatial firing in these lateral cells. But so, so very different types of information that these two brain areas were provided in the hippocampus. So we started thinking that maybe if the medial toronto area does this path integration and associates movements through space with the landmarks that one encounters as one's space. Uh, this provides what O'Keefe and Nadell in their book, as the hippocampus as a cognitive map, proposed uh, an objective sp spatial framework <laughs> uh -huh. that the hippocampus uses to uh, interrelate all the items and events of experience. And this was the idea. It's, it's not well appreciated, but that, that book by O'Keefe and Adele was really a theory of episodic memory. It's primarily thought about as a theory of, of maps and spatial learning navigation, but it's very clear that um, they considered the spatial representation, the spatial mapping is the core function of the campus. But one of its roles was to be the organizing framework to encode all of your experience in the, in the world. Uh, so as we're having experience now, you're, you're, you're in your home office and, and, and um, you're, 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 you're watching your computer monitor and the, that visual information is coming in and you're hearing the sound of your my voice and 
you may be hearing something else. You're having a lot yeah, more experience. My, my, our cat briefly. Okay, great. Also, oh, all these things. So the hippocampus is sort of the gets information, highly processed information from all different sense senses, from from the hearing, vision, smell, uh, you know, smell sensation, hearing, you know, you know, you know, touch. Uh, it all gets funneled to the campus, and the thought is that in an experience, the spatial map is the organizing framework that binds together all the disparate parts of an experience, which are being processed in different parts of your brain. As I said before, vision gets processed here, hearing gets processed around here, uh, smell is deep in the brain, <laughs> yeah. uh, your prefrontal cortex here, that's where your thoughts are and, 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 and so forth. Again, very loosely speaking. <laughs> but the idea is that different parts of the brain are involved. And now how do you recreate a memory of what you're experiencing now. The idea is that all this information gets funneled into the campus, bound on this map-like representation, such that later on, to retrieve that memory, your brain reactivates your map of where you were and at what time you were, and that gets reactivated. And, 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 and because all the information is bound onto the map, it allows the other parts of the brain to become reactivated in a way that allows you to relive the experience that you previously had to some degree. And that's what we can, that's what we call an episodic memory, a conscious recollection, a reminiscence of a prior event. Yeah. So if the medial entorhinal, the grid cells and all this spatial information is, creates this spatial framework, the thought is that maybe the lateral entorhinal cortex, this other pathway carries the information about what you're experiencing. Yes. The sights, the sounds, the smells, the thoughts, the emotions, all of that maybe comes to the lateral pathway. And then the, and the, the campus then binds the, the, the items and events of experience, you know, keeping the Adele's terms, with these objective spatial framework that comes from the medial pathway, binds it together, and that's the basis of human episodic memory. And as you mentioned earlier, that's why in, in, in Alzheimer's patients, the earliest symptoms or two of the earliest symptoms that seem unrelated but are totally related are getting lost and having memory deficits. Yeah. And, and, and that's the, the earliest signs of, 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 of Alzheimer's. Yeah. The patients all the time they're, they're in a familiar environment and they don't know where they are. Yeah. And then or they'll do things and they'll, they'll say something and then three minutes later they'll repeat what they said and so forth. This is before, this yeah. is why people are still lucid they're, 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 they're still intelligence and all, everything's fine, but th th these specific things, the memory problems and, 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 and spatial getting disoriented and lost are together. And, and, and we think they're related because of this function of the hippocampus of not yeah. only creating these maps, but then using that to store memories. My father had a, a dementia that, that when he was living, it was diagnosed as probable Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. And the first thing that me and my brother and sister noticed is that when we talked to him on the phone, just what you said, he'd, he'd ask us a question and then a minute later, he'd ask us the same question, not remembering he'd yeah. previously asked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, absolutely. And, and anyone who, who has had a family member with Alzheimer's and was around, you know, similar. It, it, it's, it's a very classic common, uh, uh, symptom. Now, uh, all these neurons that you're recording activity in uh, deploy the neurotransmitter glutamate, and that's the excitatory circuits throughout the brain use glutamate as a neurotransmitter. And then there's this, these local neurons that don't project very far, just locally, say, within the hippocampus called interneurons that use the inhibitory transmitter GABA. And there's quite a bit of evidence, and we've contributed some to this, my lab, that uh, very early in Alzheimer's disease, there's hyperexcitability. These glutamatergic neurons, the activity seems to be getting out of control. Now, you did some recent studies with Michaela Gallagher that were, uh, can you talk about that, that are, are relevant to this? 
so an interesting aspect. Let me let me just step back a second and I'll head into that work. But just to put it still in in, in the broader context, uh, um, it turns out in Alzheimer's disease, uh, the human homolog or, or the, the brain area in humans <laughs> that is one of the first areas to start showing the classic sim uh, histological you know, the, the, the plaques and tangles that that define Alzheimer's disease. Uh, one of the first areas to show that is this lateral entorhinal cortex area. Yeah. And Michaela Gallagher's lab, you know, Michaela Gallagher, my, my, my colleague here at Hopkins, who is a you know, world renowned expert on, on, on aging in the brain, um, her lab had previously been showing other effects of uh, suggesting that this lateral entorhinal area, even in rats who don't get naturally get Alzheimer's, but their brains do age. <laughs> and show cognitive decline in some fraction of the animals. Um, uh, the effects seem to be more in this lateral pathway than the medial pathway. So going back to this idea that we think this lateral pathway may be involved in carrying information about what you were experiencing, the, the content of an experience, as opposed to the context. That's what we like to say, this little pithy content versus context lateral enterhinal content, medial context, that, uh, that, the, that that may be the reason why there's these memory deficits. The part of the brain that, that provides information about what you're experiencing is getting damaged. And in our rodent experience, we, what we found is that there are cells in the lateral frontal cortex that fire uh, to objects in the environment as a rat explores the environment. Uh, mm -hmm. And importantly, they encode it from the rat's point of view, <laughs> or it's called egocentric coding is what we, we would call it. Okay, so the idea is that um, these hippocampal cells, the grid cells and the play cells, they encode in the world's point of view. That it doesn't matter if, if, if a play cell, I said earlier, it's maybe say play cell fires here. It doesn't care if the rat's head or body is pointed that way or that way or that way. So it's really, and, 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 and it's called a, an allocentric, a world-based coordinate frame. But the lateral entorhinal cells do care about the rat's point of view. So we find some cells that were, were respond, say when the animal's at sort of relative to an object here, but only when the object is the animal's right. If the animal turns around, now the object's the animal's left, the cell won't fire. Other cells seem to fire when the rat's running around, when the walls of the apparatus are to its right. But when the rat turns around and now when the wall is to its left, the cell doesn't fire. So it seems to encode the world from the rat's point of view. And we think that is consistent with this idea of these process extremes. I'm experiencing this right now from my point of view, okay? And if all this sights and sounds and all are coming in from this lateral pathway, I'm experiencing it from my point of view. If I remember this conversation later on tonight, I'm not going to suddenly experience it from your point of view. Right. Or I'm not going to experience it from this bird's eye overhead point of view. I'm going to experience it. I'm going to remember it from my point of view. So we think this lateral, there's more evidence that this lateral pathway is involved in encoding the things the animal experiences from its point of view and what humans experience from their point of view. And then that's the information that gets bound onto this world centered map like representation to then support memories. So then this part of the brain that does this self-centered, this egocentric point of view processing is what seems to be early on affected in Alzheimer's as well as on, 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 on aging you know, related cognitive decline that's not necessarily Alzheimer's related. So that's kind of the backdrop into how we started getting interested in aging. Well, okay, if this part of the brain that our lab is particularly interested in studying is what seems to be very early on affected in these, in, with, with age-related cognitive decline, let's try to figure out what's going wrong with that. Um, so we started working with, my, with, with Gallagher group on doing experiments. And the first experiment we did was saying, well, well, let's look at a part of the brain and the campus that again, receives input from these two pathways. And one part of the campus is called the CA3 region. The campus looks like this, it's like you take two, uh, uh, well, actually, it looks just like this behind me. That's the hippocampus, that beautiful picture. <laughs> I, I should know, Jim, at this point, um, I did do a short introductory video to this series of podcasts, and okay. that's up on the YouTube channel, and 
Yeah, I have some image that I have Cajal's classic. Uh, right. And where he, a hundred years ago, kind of surmised what, how the direction of information flow. And right. you've got a hippocampus on the wall right behind you. That's right. There so we that's go. A, that's, a, that's a brain bow image of the hippocampus. <laughs> <laughs> All the different colors, the different cells. You can the see the, the two C-shaped layers. That's right. So, so this part right here, is what's called the CA3 region. It's, it's a specific processing stage in the hippocampus. And it's the focus of a lot of theoretical work on, on, on memory and how are memories stored in the brain, not just in a single cell, but, but distributed on many different cells. And uh, a number of years ago, our lab had shown that, that this region along, along here, that this part of CA3 was actually different from this part of CA3 in terms of its functions. All the models that people have done for years, all the theoretical work had treated CA3 as a homogeneous structure. Hmm. And we knew from anatomy that was not the case, <laughs> but we, we, we showed uh, uh, with, with recordings these cells that, that they, were, uh, they were different from each other, that uh, the part of CA3 that was sort of tucked inside what's called the dentate gyrus seems to be more involved in what's called pattern separation is the jargon. The idea is that if you want to remember, uh, if, you, if you have an experience and then you experience something very similar, uh, that you don't want to get confused between those two memories. Uh, the way people study this in humans uh, is they will give a person a picture of say a, a, a coffee cup and they'll just look at that. And then later on, they'll give them a picture of a similar coffee cup, but maybe slightly rotated. So it looks very much the same, but slightly different. And they'll compare that to another completely novel object. And each time they'll ask the person, okay, is this the same? This might what, what you first saw, and now you see this. And they'll say, is this the same thing you saw before? Or is this slightly different from you saw before? Or is it completely new? So young people have no problem saying, okay, if you show me this and then show me it again, that's the same thing. If you show me this and then you show me this, it's totally different. If you show me this, then you show me this, they'll say, well, that's similar to what you showed me before, but it's not identical. As you get older and older, you get, it's harder and harder for you to remember <laughs> that you saw this and not this. Yeah. And the thought is that brain mechanisms that take these similar inputs, they make the, how the brain encodes these different inputs, they, they make them more different from each other. And that's what's called pattern separation. Very similar inputs, the cup and the rotated cup in the visual cortex, say, they're represented by very similar neurons because they are very similar visually. And the hippocampus get split apart into very different representations. And that's what allows a young person to recognize that you're showing me this, not this, even though their visual cortex can hardly distinguish the two. But conceptually, they, they can remember them differently because the hippocampus has, has, has made them very distinct. And as you get older and older, your ability to make these things distinct gets worse and worse and worse and worse, <laughs> such that you're more likely to see the rotated cup and think that's the same cup you saw before. Yeah. So what we discovered that in the CA3 region, it works with this region, the dentate gyrus, to do this called, called what? This idea of pattern separation that they charge is not a very old idea. I'm not taking credit for that. <laughs> yeah. But the fact that this part of CA3 seems to be more involved working with that compared to this part of CA3, which does the opposite uh, uh, computation, um, is, is different. Yeah. So that's the backdrop. And then the question, what about aging? It turns out, as I said before, all, when you get older, you lose the ability to easily remember distinguish two very similar input patterns. Um, so where what we showed that this part of CA3 uh, seems to have more excitable cells 
compared to this part of, of, of CA3. And that difference in, in, in old animals. In old animals. In old animals. And this is also following up on, on, on the work of Gallagher and other people where they'd shown this effect in general in hippocampus. And we seem to narrow it down more to this part of CA3 that seems to be involved along with this used to call the dente gyrus in this pattern separation phenomenon. And we, we, we now have a paper under review where uh, we have evidence now by recording the neurons firing patterns, suggesting indeed that their ability to this pattern separation uh, in old animals with memory impairments is, you know, is, is deficient. So there is this relationship we think, going back to ideas from the Gallagher lab and others about neural hyperactivity just makes the processing network, it just disrupts the normal processing. The brain likes to, 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 to work within certain ranges. Yeah. It doesn't like neurons that fire too fast or too slow. There's a, a certain range of, 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 of electrical activity that is necessary for the, for the circuits in the brain to work properly. And when they get out of whack, the, for some process, the cells fire too much or too little, this, the, the circuit doesn't work right. So we, so we think that's what's happening here with, with old animals. Um, and if, if you look at the hippocampus from someone who died from Alzheimer's disease, it's those pyramidal neurons in C3 and, and also the more dorsal region, CA1, that die, whereas the dentate granule neurons don't seem to die. And um, so this hyperexcitability can actually kill neurons? process called excitotoxicity? Yeah, I, 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 certainly that is true, that uh, if excitotoxicity, right? If you have cells that fire too much, that can kill brain cells. Uh, um, I, I, I'm actually not, uh, the relationship between cell death and Alzheimer's and how much that's due to excitotoxicity or not, actually, I'm not really familiar with that myself. Yeah, that's, I, I, I'm, I'm more familiar with that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's quite a bit of evidence for that uh, okay. experimentally. For example, uh, Alzheimer's patients have like 30 fold more incidence of epileptic seizures. Yeah. Uh, the amyloid protein, as it accumulates, it can render neurons vulnerable to excitotoxicity. And aging itself, the, the things that go on in neurons during aging kind of predispose them to this hyperexcitability and, and, and eventually death. One of the, the only drug that, that's prescribed for Alzheimer's patients that has any effect, although it's very small on the, their cognitive decline, is a drug called memantine, which blocks a certain type of glutamate receptor. Yeah. So anyway, there's, but I, I just did a podcast, recorded it earlier this week with Dennis Choi, who's, he's very well known in the excitotoxicity yeah. field. So people can look at that. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, it certainly is not surprising that'd be the case. Uh, yeah. and, and, and certainly um, when these cells become hyperactive, um, you know, the brain has mechanisms to try to counteract that. Yeah. So yeah. if the pyramidal cells, the cells that have this excitatory transmitter, glutamate, like you mentioned, fire too much, well, that can increase the activity of these interneurons you mentioned before, well, whose job is with feedback to then tamp them down. So there are all sorts of, yeah. of, of, of brain mechanisms in place to you know, homeostasis and yeah. try to keep the brain at certain levels. But, yeah. but then, but that, that will go so far, right? And I guess the idea is once yeah, things get out of whack. They can the the, 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 the hyperactivity can override the brain's natural yeah. mechanisms to keep it at the right level, and that's yeah. when you start getting all sorts of extra problems. That's right. Let's see. Um, uh, virtual reality. Um, can you say anything about has virtual reality? Um, so, for example, if you do human human brain imaging, right? You're in the MRI. You're laying down in the MRI. You're not you're not physically moving through your environment. So, 
in order to, and I assume this is some of the evidence for the existence of the grid cells and maybe play cells in the humans comes from those kinds of studies. So they use virtual reality. Uh, has anyone looked at, well, can you first, do you have anything, any comments on that beyond what you've already said? Other than that, it, it is a technique that's becoming increasingly employed. As you mentioned before, that is almost exclusively how people study um, in the humans, these properties I'm talking about. And you mentioned before epilepsy patients that you actually can get recordings of individual neurons in humans like we do with rats, but in only very special cases. And these are patients that for therapeutic reasons have electrodes implanted as, as, as their doctors try to find the, where the epileptic seizures start. And the hippocampus is very susceptible to epilepsy and to, to being yes. the trigger of epilepsy. Yes. And so they'll often try to put electrodes to figure out where in the hippocampus is the bad yeah. tissue that starts the epilepsy. Uh, so they can then try to do a surgical procedure or, or, or others. But then while, while patients are in the hospital for a few weeks or however long it takes waiting for <laughs> a seizure to occur, you know, sometimes you can get recordings and investigators will work with them to and use the virtual reality systems oh. to then record the activity of single neurons even in humans oh. um, you don't have the same control we do with the animal experiments and it's very, it's very limited what you can do but it certainly is one of the things that gives us confidence for those experiments that by studying the rats we're on the right track to also understanding <laughs> the human hippocampus and that's what they find as you mentioned they have people doing virtual reality navigation tasks through a virtual world They'll find cells that will respond when they virtually navigate this part of the virtual world and not that part and, and, and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, co we covered a lot of ground and I'm gonna put in the description, you know, with this video uh, links to a couple of your lectures. Uh, one, I, one I watched when you went back to Texas Oh yeah, okay. Uh, and then uh, links to a couple of your, or a few of your review articles on different aspects of what we've talked about. Great. Today. Great. Okay, Jim, I enjoyed talking with you and. Uh, me too, I enjoyed it, it was, it was a lot of fun. So I, I, I watched some of the ones you put on already too. They, they're, very, they're very interesting, so it's great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Jim, take care. All right, Mark, see you, bye. Yeah, bye.